Welcome back to the VinWiki appraisal panel where we appraise the amazing car collections of various YouTubers and automotive influencers. Today is one that I have been super excited for since we began this series. We're going to appraise the car collection of Ralph Lauren, or Ralph Lauren, depending on how you say it. And it wouldn't have been possible for us to do this without the research and help of Dan Doucette. You'll recognize him from some of his videos here, his support of Arnie and Doug in their cannonball record attempts. He was even my co-driver in John Ficarra's event, The Musket Ball, last year alongside Christopher Michaels. You can follow Dan's Automotive Adventures at Aero 108 on Instagram, and I certainly appreciate his help with this and several other amazing lists that we've had him working on. Now, of course, he has far more cars than we could talk about in the time you see this video running today. So each of us is just going to pick our favorite five or so cars, and we'll all appraise those 15 or so. He has about 55 cars that we could list. Now, of course, he has many, many more, but none of the lists that you find if you Google Ralph Lauren's car collection are actually that complete. So this is going to be a whole lot of fun. And as always, I am joined by John Ficara of Ficara Classic and John Tamarian from Curated. Thank you, Ed. It's an honor to be with this distinguished group of gentlemen. Great to be here, Ed. And I can't wait to get started on this collection because now we're in my wheelhouse. No supercars. <laughs> Now, none of this would be possible if it weren't for Auto Tempest. Auto Tempest allows you to search all the major listing sites and take all the results and put them into one place. It makes your searching a lot more powerful, a lot more efficient, and it allows you to dig into the deep, dark corners of the internet by searching nationally on sites like Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace. I love it. Obviously, they support us here at VinWiki. They've supported Kartrek, and they're making our appraisal panel possible today. So I'm going to talk about my five favorite cars on Ralph Lauren's list, and it's really hard to pick because there are so many amazing ones, but my favorite pre-war car of all time is the Blower Bentley. Now, it's a 1929 Bentley 4.5 liter car, but it is one of the few that is supercharged. So there's 500 or so 4.5 liter cars, and about 50 are blowers. But of those blowers, only five or so are the actual Bentley Boys race cars, and this is number four. Built by Sir Henry Birkin, this was a car that competed in a ton of amazing places. It didn't necessarily win, but the values of these cars are incredible. You'd pay about a million dollars for a four and a half liter car today, or even a good replica of a blower car. And these cars, no one's transacted one in a while, and that's going to be a common theme among Ralph Lauren's car collection. But I think today, based on 2012, a transaction that in today's money is about 7.9, his exact car to me is six million bucks. Well, first off, Ed, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit on these things being softer. Um, once a blue chip, always a blue chip. These cars are going to be worth more and more money every year, guaranteed. I don't care how young the kids are or what they're into. These classics are always going to be classics. They're works of art and they're some of the most amazing cars ever built. Now, the blower, Bentley, is just, you know, one of the greats. And it was supposed to be the James Bond car. You know, Ian Fleming, that's what he wrote, was supposed to be the blower Bentley. But we got an Aston Martin instead. I, it is true that the racing cars haven't sold. They, they, don't, they don't move. These, these great cars don't change hands very often. And when they do, most people don't know about it. They don't go into big auctions. I honestly think this car is worth a little bit more than what you think. Um, I would go up to $7 million on this in a private exchange between two hardcore collectors. So I am completely out of my wheelhouse here, uh, but I'm a huge fan of these cars. I think they're absolutely gorgeous. The, the gentleman that helped us produce the Countach rally actually did a rally of this generation of Bentleys and blower Bentleys, and they were just so impressive to see them during Monterey Car Week. I have to agree with Ed that there is a generational shift that's happening now, and, and my real gut is that while there's certain icons that will always be have insane value, things like a 250 GTO, things like a really special Gullwing. I think some of these cars, you have to question who's the future buyer. The, the buyers are changing today. I don't think these cars are gonna plummet. They're blue chip and I, will, I do believe that they will have a plateau in their value, but I don't think they'll, we'll continue to see them go up in value. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go with exactly what Ed said, uh, and I am going to say $6 million. Now, we can't go through Ralph Lauren's car collection without talking about his 1938 Bugatti Type 57 SC Atlantic. Now, they made about 700 SCs, 
and there's a lot of amazing versions of them. He's actually got another one, the 57SC Gangloff Drophead Coupe, that's probably a 15 to $20 million car. But this car has long been heralded as the most valuable car in the world. Now, SC means Service Compressure in French that I've now butchered. Obviously, it means that it's supercharged, lowered, faster. It went 125 miles per hour in the 30s. And there's only two of these remaining. One was destroyed by a train. The other is at the Mullen Automotive Museum in Los Angeles. And when that car sold, it sold for $38 million. And at the time, that was the most valuable car in the world, then more valuable than 250 GTOs even at the time. Obviously, we saw the Uhlenhaut Coupe sell for $142 million from Mercedes early this year. So I don't know that this car is beyond that today, but given what it is and the significance of what the car is, I wouldn't think that Ralph Lauren would ever think of selling it for anything that didn't have nine figures in it. So I'm going to say $100 million. I think you're pretty close on that, Ed. Um, I don't know if it's the most valuable car in the world. I mean, there's a few cars that can that could fight for that title. Um, the first Duesenberg road car ever built, I know that uh, Jay Leno offered a blank check for that car and wasn't sold. That car will never be sold. That car is now in a museum for its entire existence. But that was a $100 million car. I put money on that. Um, this car is special. Um, I don't think... Laurent will ever sell it. I'm, you know, when he passes away, maybe his estate will move it. But I, I'm, I'm agreeing with you on this, Ed. I think this is, this is a hundred million dollar car. This is where I have to agree with you, Fakara. Is, is this is just so iconic. I mean, when this car was shown uh, at Pebble, it, it's just. It's a breathtaking car, and it's always been known as, is that the world's most expensive car? So I'm going to actually say it is probably worth closer to the recent most world's expensive car, which was the 300 SLR that you mentioned, Ed. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to put it a little bit above 100 million because I think we are seeing you know, masses amount of wealth chasing the same stuff. It's like, I want to be the best. I want to have the best. And, and I think when you're talking about something that, you know, you could call this even if there is a, a word beyond blue chip. Um, I think wealth will always chase the really, really, really special pieces. So I'm going to say 110 million. You're contradicting yourself sort of here, right? Now you're saying that these cars are worth a ton of money to the right people with the right kind of money. The, all, of, all of his cars are those type of cars. There's nothing here that's going to sell in a used car lot. They're all moving from one collector to another. I totally agree with you, but I think it's about the very specific car. And to me, this car is even iconic, whereas a, a blower Bentley is not as iconic when specifics, <laughs> when specifically talking about it. The value here is that, according to your price, you could buy 10 or 11 or 12 blower Bentleys for the price of this car. There's value right there. Only $6 million for the Bentley. I mean, why would you spend $100 million? But, you know, by that logic, if I'm in his position and I've owned this car since it won Pebble Beach in 1990, thinking that it's the most valuable car in the world, how do you ever not sell it for more than any car's ever sold for? So by that logic, it's an easy 150 because it would never move for any less because why are you going to take it down a notch and let it be the second most valuable car on earth? I agree. I, I'm changing my price to 150. <laughs> I agree with you, Ed, and I think I think we. I, I, part of my belief of this next generation is that we will also maybe see a lot of this, these these cars and this wealth just don donated into museums. And I've I've a ton of collectors putting their cars in trusts and doing things so that the cars are never sold. So we might never know the value of a lot of these really special cars. Now let's talk about two of his newer Bugattis, some of my favorites, the Veyrons. Now he's got a 2006 that he bought new. It's a black car. It's now been upgraded to the Sang Noir wheels. And he has a Super Sport World Record Edition car. Now the early cars have strengthened a lot. There was a time where you could buy one for under a million dollars. A couple of them sold in the eights. One actually sold in the sixes. But now, especially a very, very nice, perfectly kept low mile car like his, I think it's worth 1.5, maybe even 1.6. Now, the world speed record car, 
to me, is just it. Obviously, John Tamari and you and I tried very, very hard to put a deal together on another one of the 43 Super Sport cars that's here in the U.S., similar to a WRE car, but there's only five of these, full bare carbon, orange accents, black interiors, and his, I believe, is one of two U.S. cars. So I put it at 2.75. Yeah, I'm not going to argue with you on these, um, both these Bugattis. I think you're pretty pretty close. These are the numbers that I came up with on the boring regular one. Uh, I came up with one five. And the SS, you're right, is a very special car. And I put that at 2.8. So I agree with you, Ed. Uh, I think the the fact that these cars belong to Ralph, I, I think they they have an increased value because they're, they're now part of one of the most iconic collections of all time. I would pay 1.6 for the regular Veyron. And I'm gonna say that the Veyron Supersport world record car, it has to be 2.9 or something like that. I'm, I'm gonna put 2.95 because it's just such a special car. It certainly is. Maybe one day I'll have one until now. The Lambos will have to do, and my fifth favorite car that's on his list is his 2009 Lamborghini Reventon Roadster. Now, we've been working on a list of all of the Vins of all the Mercies, which would include the 22 Reventon Coupes and the 15 Reventon Roadsters. Now, his Roadster is the only U.S. car. Now, I don't know what you have to do to have the only one that has a real, doesn't even appear to be show or display title, but I think that car is worth two and a half. Wow, that's a bit more. I, You know, you guys are the Lamborghini guys, and I always seem to be a bit low on these. I came in at 2.3, but um, I will always defer to the both of you guys as the Lamborghini experts. Well, thank you, John. What an introduction. Um, I... Uh... <laughs> I think I think Ed, you're you're right on the money. I'm gonna put it even a little bit more. There's some recent transactions of some low mileage Reventone coupes that sold between 1.8 and 2 million dollars. My opinion is this is the only roadster you can get into the U.S. for a very long time. It's part of one of the best collections in the world. I'm gonna put it at 2.6 million. Well, there you go, John Ficaro. What were your five favorites? Well, it's. It Talking about being spoiled for choice, uh, Ralph Lauren's aesthetic is just, you know, t world class and not to be believed. And uh, when I lived in New York, you, you could trip over his cars being displayed at museums and stores and they were everywhere. And, I'm, and, I, and I applaud him for sharing them with the world because it really, these could all be stashed away. We would never know about them like a lot of collectors do. But starting my list uh, is his 1938 Alfa Romeo 8C 2900B Millimilia car. And it is, first of all, it's gorgeous. It's got a straight eight, it's supercharged, 2.9 liter, um, independent front suspension, trans leaf, transverse rear leaf suspension. This thing was super high tech. They they built four of them in that year for the Millimilia. And it is, I mean, gorgeous. And on top of that, fantastic to drive. Not that I've had the opportunity to do it. Now this one's special because the second owner took it to Pikes Peak. The third owner was Phil Hill, the American ch champion. Um, and he won the Pebble Beach race in it when he was like a kid. And then it would go back to Pebble Beach and win the Concour uh, win its class, I think, in the Concours in 2005. It is a special, special car. I think the most expensive Alpha to sell at auction um, was a very special car. That went for close to $20 million. I got to put this car pretty close to that, being that it's in Ralph's collection. I put it at $18 million. The 8C is one of the most legendary cars of all time. And like the Blower Bentleys, like the McLaren F1s, like the 250 Ferraris, it's kind of a club to have one. And so whenever one changes hands, it is a very, very big deal. And this certainly is among the best of the best 8Cs to exist. So I put it at 17 million, just a little bit shy of your number, John. I, I have to agree with you guys. I, again, the 8C is just so iconic. Uh, I think any major collection of pre-war cars has one. I have a few clients that actually have them in their collections. And I remember last year, I think at Pebble Beach, they had a display of these cars. And again, I'm not a pre-war guy, but they even captivate, captivated me as well. And, and I'm going to agree with you guys. I'm going to put it at 17 million. All right. So my next car in the list um, is, a, is a model that's very, very dear to me because I've done a big story on it before. It was the Ferrari 250 LM. 
He has one. I <laughs> mean, just to have one. That car was built as the replacement for the 250 GTO in the GT category. And they FIA wouldn't have it. So it ended up being this kind of orphan Ferrari that had to compete against the full prototypes back in the day. It won Le Mans in 1965. You can see my video on VinWiki about that. One of the great victories of Le Mans at all time. This car was uh, shipped to Australia. It was one of the privateer cars. And um, that's primarily who ran them because the factory wasn't terribly interested in them. And it did really, really well in Australia. And I think it also was in New Zealand. And little known fact, a young Jackie Stewart actually drove this car once. And it never, it never had any heavy crashes or shunts. And it was really well restored. It's an amazing car. Now, that the car that won Le Mans, I think that car is 80, 90 million dollars because it's the last Ferrari that ever won Le Mans overall. Um, I think this one would be a bargain at $35 million. John, I loved your story and I appreciate you telling it here in such an amazing fashion. The LM is certainly an amazing version of the 250. To me, it wouldn't be where I would spend that amount of money on a vintage Ferrari. It's another one on his list. So I'm gonna put it at 25 million. John, every time that we're on this panel, I feel like I've learned so much from you. Uh, so it's, it's very humbling and, and I could listen to your stories all day. So I think this car is just stunning. They're so, so cool. It's such a, a breakaway from Ferrari, this mid-engine racing car. I'm gonna agree. I think, you know, if the car was raced by a privateer and wasn't really, you know, mostly original panels, uh, you know, unlike some of the other cars that were raced heavily or damaged or crashed, uh, I'm gonna put this at 35 million as well. All right, third on my list is, believe it or not, Another Ferrari, and this one's kind of special to me. This is a 250TR Scaglietti pontoon car. And the reason I picked it is this was the car, when I was a kid, I went to the Monterey Historics and we walked through the paddock and there was one of these sitting with stanchions around it and a crowd of people staring at it. It was like right in the middle of the paddock and they started it and you would have thought the Pope had arrived. There was like silence and reverence. And when it's fired up, when that three liter Colombo V12 kicked in, I was in love. And I think it's one of the most gorgeous cars ever built. Um, it, and in person, there's no bad angle on it. It's, it's, it's amazing. Now these cars back in the day, they raced from 58 to 61. They won Le Mans, they won Sebring, they won the Targa Florio, they, they won everything. They were the dominant car in different style bodies. Um, now this car never raced, it's, it's a customer car, so it didn't have all the advancements of some of the factory cars. And the fact that it never raced um, does devalue it a little bit, but it is perfection. It never has been crashed. It is a completely original car. It is stunning. I put it at $28 million. Lovely description, and I feel the same way. Amongst all the 250 variants, amongst all the vintage Ferraris, if I were to have the money to buy one, it would be a 250 TR. It is gorgeous. It is everything that a vintage racing Ferrari needs to be. And the fact that this one is so nice and so immaculate, like all of Ralph Lauren's cars are, I said 30 million, but whatever it took, if I could do it, this is the one I'd have. So one day I'll tell this story on VinWiki, but there's this, I chased a 250 TR that, that might have been completely mythical for, for a long time. And I actually had one of my clients interested in the car. And depending upon the condition or history, he was willing to pay anywhere between 35 and $40 million. Now, that's a big number. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just say 35 million because I don't know the market that well. And obviously, I mean, not many transact at all. Uh, but I'm going to put this car at 35 million. Well, that'd be strong money. And I would probably pay that as well to get my hands on one of those. That's one of my dream cars. Another one of my dream cars. I mean, Ralph's got all my dream cars. I, I could just live at his house. I mean, <laughs> just sit me in the middle of his collection for the rest of my life. I would be happy. Um, I would totally take this car out for a spin, his Jaguar D-Type. And the, the D-Type was the Jaguar racing car from the 50s. And that car won Le Mans in 55, 56, and 57 and took first, second, third, fourth, and sixth place in that race. It was utterly dominant. They were amazing cars. And you gotta think about like back then, these cars had a 3.4 liter straight six. 
Um, it was one of the first monocoque built race cars, so it didn't have a, a chassis in it. Um, they were super light. They were capable of over 170 miles an hour and the Molson straight. In fact, they clocked one at 178 miles an hour. You're talking about, you know, you're sitting in a tin can at those speeds. It's it's staggering. But just to be close to one of these, um, this is one of the one of the six or ten I forget long nose versions of it. The factory cars. This is a factory race car, uh, 1956. It raced at Sebring. It raced at a few places. No big victories, but also. It's hard to it's hard to put a price on something just because of what it's won. This is such a special car. It did have a huge shunt uh, back in the day, uh, but from what I understand, most of the original car is there. It's not like it was kind of scraped away. This is always a worry with classic race cars is that they have like just pieces of the original car suspension attached to a brand new car. This is the original chassis. Um, so I put this car and because. Like Lamar winning cars close to 20 million. I think this thing would be great at $10 million. Wow. Well, it's spectacular. It's gorgeous. And that's one of the things about some of these vintage race cars is that, you know, this one is undeniably beautiful. And I, it's one of those cars that even if you never started it, you could stare at it like a poster forever. And I hope he gets it out as much as the car deserves to be. I love it. I put it at 8 million bucks. So this is one of my favorite cars ever made. Uh, I, I think this is just the, one of the coolest racing cars. Uh, I, I fell in love with these cars as a kid. My dad happens to also be a huge Jaguar nut. Uh, he has his XKE that, that belonged to the family. Our family knew. If one day I hit the lotto or something happens, I will be buying a Jaguar D-Type. That being said, if you look at recent auction sales, the cars have actually slumped over time in price. And I think this is where this argument that, that me and Fakara will, will, will sort of banter back and forth, that there is a generational shift. Now, there is a generational shift. I'm into the 80s and 90s supercars, but the D-Type is a goal for me. Um, John brings up some great points about a major shunt. I think I'm gonna be more cautious and I'm gonna put this car at seven and a half million. I would buy that car for seven and a half million. That would be, and then I'd take a little extra money and buy one of one of Ed's Bugattis. Um, so the next car on my list is, um, and, and this car, like, if you have to be a car collector, you find things that are one of one, and this is one of one. His 1930 Mercedes SSK, the Count Trossi car. Now this, they made 42 SSKs back in the day. They were super light versions of, of the Mercedes. Um, this must be the most rare and special example of it because its history is really wild. It was shipped to Japan, originally brand new as a chassis, and then it didn't sell. So they shipped it back to Milan where they put a, a spider body on it and it went and ran at the Villa Milia. Um, and then Count Trossi got a hold of it. And this guy, no one's even sure who designed this body. Um, it could have been Trossi, it could have been an American designer. They have all the different theories. Um, it's very mysterious, terribly mysterious. But if you had to build a Batmobile in the 1930s, this was it. It is just an amazing looking car. It is one of one. It is insanely special. Um, you can't replace it. You can't find another one. Um, I put it at $45 million. <sighs> Well, I will say that an SSK that wasn't owned by somebody you don't want to talk about is getting harder and harder, but this is a very special car. I put it at 40 million, a little softer than that, but wow, what a story. I think again, this is something that, you know, there's it, it's worth whatever someone in the world is willing to pay for it. And I think in, in the collector world, any of the, these important cars from Ralph's collection are just so well known. And, and if it ever came up for sale, it could probably sell well over 40 or 45 million just because it's a well-known car out of out of his collection. Um, I'm going to I'm going to sort of fit right in between you guys. And I'm going to say 42 million. So the last car on my list. I'm going to be terribly predictable and I'm going to pick his Porsche 959. It's a comfort that they built the most of those. I mean, they only built a little over 300 of these cars to begin with. Most of them were comforts. Uh, it's a silver car, so it wasn't a special color, 
but it's Ralph Lorenz and he drives it. There's pictures of him in New York City driving this thing around. I'm not sure what the mileage is on it, but he does use it. It does go in for service from time to time. It is, of course, one of the greatest Porsches, if not one of the greatest sports cars ever built. You know, it has all wheel drive, one of the first six speed manual transmissions. It's made out of Kevlar. I mean, it has hollow magnesium wheels. The list goes on and on of how special this car, what a spaceship it was in the early 80s. Um, and I've done a video on that car as well. It is really, technologically, it was 20, 30 years ahead of its time. We're building cars like that now, and this was a spaceship. So I love 959s. One of them, a comfort, because usually the sports, they build very few sports, those usually sell for a premium well over what the comforts sell for. But a comfort sold on bring a trailer for 2.2 million. And I was, and I think a lot of people were surprised by that. Uh, it was a very, very low mileage car. I still think a uh, comfort, a nice driven comfort is, is, and even, even if you asked me a couple of years ago, I would tell you it wasn't worth this, but I think that's a $2 million car and you add another million dollars for the S. Um, but I think it's a $2 million car in reality. I, and 959s are selling and they are moving and they're moving up market. So I might be a complete moron for saying two. I should probably be saying 2.5 to cover my butt, but I'm gonna say two for now. Well, I would always yield to you on your 959 opinions. My gut was 2.2, .2, so I'm glad to know that I was in the right range. I want to cry when I hear these numbers. We had three or four 959s, or, or I would say late last year, and we sold them anywhere between 1.6 and 1.8, and they were all very, very low mileage, really nice cars. So uh, I, I, won't, I won't talk about the money that I left on the table. That being said, you, you nailed it, John. It's, it's one of the greatest Porsches ever made, one of the greatest supercars ever made. And I agree, they're, they're going up in value. There's, there's, I think you nailed it at saying a comforts, you know, two million plus and an S is an additional million bucks. And I think it, it just depends on miles and service history. So um, you're right on the money. I'm gonna put this car at $2 million. All right, Tamarian, what were your favorites? So my favorites, uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna go very, very iconic here. Um, and, and I'm gonna put the first car as a car that's sort of close to my heart. And I've told this story on VinWiki before about my how my grandfather owned a 250 GTO. And, and listen, when we talk about, you know, iconic Ferraris and famous Ferraris, everyone talks about the 250 GTO. And, you know, I, I think we've been lucky to see cars transact with a lot of the Ralph Lauren cars. They're so rare that we haven't seen a car publicly sell. Uh, I think it was last year, the year prior, David McNeil of WeatherTech famously purchased a car from Gooding & Co. for I think it was 71 or 72 million. Um, and Ralph's car is an incredible history. It was a car that was originally brought to the U.S. by Luigi Canetti of NART Racing. Uh, it was campaigned by Roger Penske for years. It wore an incredible livery. It was blue with a white stripe, I believe. So incredible car. It was actually displayed at one point in, in its bare aluminum showing just how original and how good the car is. So I, I think, listen, this car could be, you know, today, if this were to transact anywhere from, you know, 75 to $85 million, who knows? But I think this is one of those cars that will always be iconic. It will always be ultra blue chip. Um, and I don't think we'll ever see the value of these cars go down. Uh, so I'm going to put this car at $80 million today. Well, there you go, John. Here you are saying that these cars are worth more and more. This is an old car. It's worth <laughs> this thing transcends generations. It's one of the, it really is one of the greatest Ferraris ever built. Um, you know, they won everything. This, you know, like, like you said, it was a NART car. It was driven by the Rodriguez brothers. It was driven by Penske. I mean, it's, it's, it is one of, of, of the GTOs. It is one of the great GTOs. And, um, these were selling privately a decade ago for $60 million, um, the really special ones. So, you know, I, I'm I'm going to push it up even higher. If this thing ever, ever, ever came up for sale, which, again, I don't think this is one of the cars that would leave his collection or wouldn't go straight to a museum. I'd put it at $90 million. 
Well, I happen to be right smack dab in the middle of you at 85 million. Uh, I saw this car at Amelia, I think it was last year, with a lot of the other Penske cars spectacularly presented. It is the Ferrari to have. Like I said, it wouldn't be the 250 that I would buy, but I think at $85 million, I wouldn't sell it if I was him for any less than 20% over the prior high. So the next car I chose had to be his F40. And what's sort of interesting about his F40 is ironically, we're right now actually selling his actual 288 GTO. Uh, he sold it, he bought it new uh, in 1985, I think imported it in 1986. Lawrence Stroll, who now is the owner of Aston Martin, originally worked with Ralph Lauren. So there's a cool story. We actually picked up the paperwork from the factory for Ralph when he worked with Ralph years ago. Um, and then at some point in 2002, 2003, Ralph sold his 288 GTO. He also, I have been chasing forever his yellow F50. He has one of two or three US yellow F50s ever produced. He sold it at some point around the same time. And look, he had, he's kept his F40, which means he absolutely must have loved his F40. If you look at car frac facts records, we believe he's probably owned this car since new. 4,000 miles. One of the original 230 US cars. The US cars have shown a massive premium. Uh, a great sort of, I would say, a metric for this car price-wise is that Saturday, this past Saturday at RM Sotheby's, they sold a US F40 that was once owned by Paul, Paul Allen. So also great history there. And that car sold just over $3.2 million. So I'm gonna put his F40 maybe a tad over that car just because it's from the Ralph Lauren collection. I think he's been the original owner from day one. I doubt he'll ever sell at this point, but I'm gonna say $3.3 .3 million. But see now, John, now I'm learning from you. See, we, we, this is great. It's in the back and forth. That's, that is an amazing story about those cars. I love the F40 and it's Ralph's car. So I'm, I'm really close to you on that one. I put it at 3.4. I put it just a touch higher at 3.5. Another absolutely critical thing to understand about these cars is that very soon, Ferrari will start allocating the replacement for the LaFerrari. And like the LaFerrari, it will likely be based on the composition of your currently owned collection. So anyone who would sell a Ferrari supercar right now is doing so to take advantage of the price spike that is happening and that will inevitably keep them out of the running for some of these cars that they're going to want in the future. And so I wouldn't sell one right now, but I think he could probably get three and a half in a second. So what's interesting about Ralph Lauren is he has a lot of duplicate cars. I mean, historically, we believe he ordered two matte black manual LP640 Roadsters. Ed owns one of them today. Uh, and he's had more other duplicate cars. And <laughs> ironically, he's one of probably very few collectors in the world, if probably the only, that has three McLaren F1s. I think there's someone that has four or five, but but he's, he's a very rare breed. He has two F1 road cars and then one of the Holy Grails. He has one of the F1 LM cars, five in the world total. Three, I believe, are with the Sultan of Brunei. I think one has been seen and, and two of the LMs are now in the States. One is in the Midwest and one is with Ralph. Uh, I believe there's a prototype car that's also at the factory, but five that were produced for customers. I mean, is this not the holy grail? It's papaya orange. I mean, I could go on and on and on about why this car is so special and so important. I don't think I need to. I mean, if you look at, you know, I see the McLaren F1 one day replacing the 250 GTO, or I should say matching the 250 GTO in price. Production numbers are definitely higher than a, a 250 GTO. I think there was 71 or 72 road cars. And then with all the racing cars in total, there's just over 100 cars produced, 106 cars produced. Uh, again, uh, you know, I think, you know, we could say there's no, there's no transactions for an F1 LM. But I would say today, I've heard rumors of a couple other special McLaren F1s. One of the GTs selling for into the, well into the 30s. I'm going to put this car at $40 million, maybe a touch more. And I'm going to say his road cars... Uh, which are basically identical. They're two Ameritech cars, same color, 
uh, again, he, he has this thing with, with, with two, in twos or multiples. I'm going to put them both at $20 million each, depending upon the miles. Uh, but it's just fantastic, the cars that Ralph owns. You know these cars much better than I do um, as far as them exchanging hands. Uh, now, the, the two F1 street cars I had at about $18 million. Um, the LM I had at about 35. But I mean, you you rub shoulders with the people who actually buy and sell these cars. I do think it's interesting that you compare this to like the, the will be the new 250 GTO. I think that's a bold statement. And I think when we're old and geezers, we'll go back to this video and see who, see if you were right. And I hope for the owners of the F1s that you are right because they are extraordinary cars and they're definitely going way up. On each of the road cars, I said 22. I think any of them to sell would set records at the time. That seems to be the trend of late. Obviously, the most interesting one is the LM. Now, I have heard that during factory service or service through BMW's center up in New Jersey, that one of the silver cars and the LM were crashed in post-servicing test driving. I don't honestly think that it matters in terms of the values of the cars. The fact that there are only two LMs in real private hands, you really can't number the car. And in our lifetime, I wholeheartedly believe one of those two cars will be the most expensive car to ever sell. I'm going to say today, if you asked around for a couple of hours, you could find someone to raise their hand at $50 million, but the days of that car being over 100 are not very far away. Woo! Strong. <laughs> yeah. I love it. That's the spirit, That's Ed. The spirit, Ed. Yeah, go buy one, Ed. Get it now. I'm on it. I am on it. So again, those were just a selection of the 55 cars that we could count that Ralph Lauren owns. There's certainly many, many more. I heard he has like 20 Jeeps at his ranch in Colorado, but those are certainly the big heavy hitters. You'll find them all at the link in the description below. When I add all of mine up, I am at $640 million, which again, I think is the most valuable single owner collection in the U.S., you could say that Lex has a bunch of stuff. You could say the McCall brothers do, but I don't think you're going to find anybody that has a harder core car collection than Ralph Lauren. I agree, Ed. I, I, I have to also say uh, that he has this incredible abilities, an incredible visionary, also color and spec. And even if you look at the cars that he sold over the time, like the matte black Murcielago SV, where every badge and emblem was matte black as well, I think he's just always a, a, a visionary in everything he does. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a little more conservative. I'm going to say $610 million, which is still insane to even think that's a conservative number. Uh, but he's one of the greatest car collectors of all time a true visionary with exceptional taste. Yeah, I don't think there's any, there's enough superlatives for Ralph Lauren's collection for the man himself. Um, he's done so much for the hobby. He's done so much for these cars. He's, still, he's done so much for the future by preserving these cars and keeping them in the public eye. And uh, I respect him immensely as a collector and as a visionary. Um, I... I'm going to go stronger on this. I think his collection is worth closer to $700 million. And over time, if he keeps collecting the way he is and he keeps he keeps these cars in his collection, I think he might have the first billion dollar car collection that we know of. Well, the Sultan of Brunei might have something to say about that, but we're having a harder time putting his list together. Uh, many would say that Jay Leno has a more valuable collection. I'll say it's not quite there, but that is going to be our next one. Again, thanks to Auto Tempest. So thank you, Auto Tempest, for supporting Car Trek, for supporting Vinwiki, and this, our appraisal panel. Thank you, John Tamarian. Thank you, John Fakara, for joining us. And everybody, I hope that you have a great day.